Good morning, everybody. Got a little bit behind this week, and I didn't get my video out, so I'm going to try to get it out right now. Last week, we talked about the deceived community and what happens when the peace community fails, because you can't blame darkness for darkness, and our world is a dark place. You blame darkness on the keepers of the light, and the church is to be the keepers of the light. And so when the peace community fails, they become the deceived community, and everything around us starts to get dark. So let's proceed and uh, go through this sermon we had last week real quickly. We need to remember our calling, that we are no longer to walk as the Gentiles also walk, and the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Now, we've already talked about sin's operating system, and this verse is just reminding us that, of that operating system. We're supposed to walk with Christ. We're supposed to have him capture our imagination and be our focus. But when we walk just like the world does, in the futility of our mind, I want you to remember that. The world walks in the futility of their mind, the empty, it's empty-headed thinking, okay? That's what futility is. It's emptiness, emptiness of their mind, being darkened in their understanding. Why? Because of sin's operating system. First, it excludes us from the life of God. It separates us from God. Because of the ignorance that is in us, we, we don't even want to do the right thing because of the hardness of our heart. It's, it's that being separated from God, not wanting what God wants for us, and then having our heart become hard. That's the road to death. We're seeing that in our culture right now. Okay, let's keep going. And they, having become calloused, have given themselves over to sensuality, and that's what happens when you get caught up in sin's operating system, you don't want God, you don't want what he wants for you, and so we walk closer and closer and flirt with death. And our heart becomes hard and we become calloused, and we've given ourselves over to sensuality because we want to feel something. <clears throat> That's all sensuality is. Sensuality is just giving ourselves over to our senses. For the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. In other words, we, we, we were created for God. Well, God, once you get a hold of him, you get all you want because you can't get anything bigger than God. But when that God-shaped vacuum inside of your heart is gone, I mean, it's well, it's not gone, but that desire for God is gone, then your desire for stuff replaces it and of course you're going to be greedy because how, you, how can you consume something as big as God if it's not going to be God? And so notice the language here. But you did not learn Christ in this way. You know, learn is a thinking term. This is indeed as you heard from him and have been taught in him just as truth as in, is in Jesus. He's calling us back to our senses. He's calling us back to think. He's calling us away from our, our sensuality and, and, and our empty-headedness to, to think. What are we doing when we do that? We're cutting off the only source of light for the world is what we're doing. So in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Remember, we separate ourselves from God. We don't want what God wants for us anymore. And when we don't want what God wants for us, we have just slipped into deceit. And the only thing that's left for us is death because we just begin to live for the moment. We begin to live for our feelings, our senses. We don't want to be good. We just want to feel good. And Paul exhorts us that we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We need to back off our emotions. We need to back off our senses. And we need to think. We need to think and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, which has been created for righteousness and holiness and truth. Now, we're going to talk about that more today. But we need to realize that from last week, this is what God wants for us. 
because it's righteousness that brings peace. It's righteousness that makes us just as a people. And if, when a people are walking in righteousness and holiness of the truth, you have a culture that is embracing the light. And it's going to be moving in the right direction. So Paul goes on and exhorts us. He says, be, be, speak truth. These are all invitations in how to employ our brain. Speak truth. Be angry and yet do not sin. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. According to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Be kind to one another. I love all these exhortations and the fact that they're piled up one right after another. Because simply this tells us what we're supposed to do when we begin to embrace our mind and think. You know, our world culture has been given over to a group think. And this is a real problem, especially in Kansas, where, you know, our, our state song has the words in it. Where never is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Now, I believe in encouragement, and I believe in the power of staying positive. But as Kansans, what do we do when there's a storm on the horizon? Do we just choose to not speak a discouraging word, lest someone think they're going to get struck by lightning? Folks, we, we've got to wake up. We, we are caught up in a group think. We don't think for ourselves. We think as a group. I know you've heard that word, groupthink culture. Looked it up in Google. Here's the definition. Groupthink is defined as the practice of thinking or making decisions as a group in a way that discourages creativity and individual responsibility. Another definition goes like this. It's a phenomenon that occurs within a group of people in which the desire for harmony and conformity in the group results in an irrational and dysfunctional decision-making outcome. Here's the idea of groupthink. Groupthink is is that we want everybody to get along. We want everybody to like each other. And so the person that there speaks up and says something negative that's going to set the group into kind of a, a reflective mode where they're somewhat fearful or, or uncomfortable. That somehow is a bad thing because ignore the storm that's on the horizon. Just ignore it. It'll go away. It's not going away. We need to learn to think for ourselves. We need to learn to reject group think. We need to engage our minds and, and live according to Christ's operating system. We need to be willing to speak the truth to one another in love. Now, that's how we deal with this group think culture, okay? We have got to learn to speak truth, and we got to learn to be able to be angry, but don't let it come out of your mouth. Don't yet do not sin. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. You can be angry, but, but there's no room for cussing or out-of-control behavior when addressing a problem. Okay, and, and, and when we do that, when we control ourselves and speak the truth in love, it's a lot easier to save face in case you're wrong, okay? But not only, these verses not only tell us that, these verses also tell us that only address what needs to be corrected for the person's good, only a word such as good for edification. Your point is less important than the person hear me now your point is less important than the person because if you lose the person you're going you're not going to make your point be we need to be selective in what we say we only address what needs to be corrected for the person's good and then we only address what needs to be addressed now according to the needs of the moment in other words, you, you may see a whole lot of things, but what's going on right now? What needs to be called attention to right now? That's what we address. So that it will give grace to those 
who hear. Always give grace. You know, when we communicate, when we talk to people about what we see coming up, we talk about the mistakes that we've made. We talk about the understanding of how it's so easy to slip in this kind of thinking, but do we really want to think like this? We use questions. And here's the beautiful thing, that if, as we give grace to those who hear, the Holy Spirit will guide us. If we don't grieve him, if we don't tell him no, if we don't tell the Holy Spirit, well, you know, God, I don't want to hear it right now. We listen and we ask good questions so that we can be a vessel used by the Holy Spirit. And in this kindness, in this mode of kindness, we begin, begin to persuade people. Now, I think there's some important things that we need to do as, as, a, as a culture, as a church. There's some stuff we bought into that's just bad stuff. We need to refine what being a judge is. This whole idea, well, you know, I don't want to judge anybody, so I'm not going to speak up because, because if I say something, I'll be judging someone, and the Bible says don't judge. And that would be a misunderstanding of what the Bible has to say. A judge is a person who condemns someone and then pronounces sentence to judge them. Okay? He inflicts pain on another person. Now, in that sense, we are not allowed to judge. We are not allowed, okay, to go after a person and shame them publicly, trying to punish them or, or trying to turn people against them or to do them bodily harm or any kind of harm. That's what judges do. Judges inflict the penalty of the law on someone. They pronounce sentence, you're guilty, now let's take you out and punish you. That's what being judge is. But here's what not being a judge is. It's being what Ezekiel calls the watchman on the wall. The watchman that sees the enemy approaching in the horizon and just chooses to announce the enemy's coming. The enemy's coming. He's not a, he's not a judge. You see, because when we operate in sin's operating system, what we do is we separate from God. But we not only separate from God, we begin to separate from each other. And the people that are the watchmen on the wall begin to notice this this phenomenon going on and, and they see the enemy at work in their midst and they say the enemy's at work notice he's the enemy is separating us from god the enemy is separating us from each other we need to we need to reconcile we need to confess our sin we need to come back together as a people because we have no weapon against this enemy except the weapons that are given to us through jesus christ when you call attention to what you see and you call for repentance and reconciliation, you are messenger of peace. You are an ambassador of the gospel. You're not being a judge. And we need to refine that. The other thing that we need to do, we need to prioritize character over feelings. A person's character is more important than their feelings. Okay, you can hurt a person's character, hurt a person's character if you give in to their feelings. You can hurt a person's feelings and build their character. We need to prioritize character because character is more important. We need to volunteer to hear the truth and seek spiritual growth. That's what makes telling the truth so much easier because, because if you see something, if you belong to a group that's already committed themselves to life change, who, who said, you know, I, I've been reading my Bible and I want to learn and I want to grow more and I want you guys to tell me the truth. Well, that person's a lot easier to tell the truth to than someone who's not interested at all, okay? So when we volunteer to hear the truth and seek spiritual growth, we set a climate that we won't be the deceived community anymore. No more the deceived community. Okay? And then when we see spiritual growth, we've got to celebrate that success. And we've got to give God the glory for it. That's just what we have to do. And then we invite others to join us. Now, this is the points that we made last week. We're going to pick this up today. We're talking about, okay, well, then how do we stay the peace community? What, how do we do that? And, and there, are some, there are some simple steps 
that have got to be taken. And, um, and for that, uh, please come. We're going to be here at 1030 and just want to invite you to join us. Love you guys. And I just hope that we can embrace this, these messages from Ephesians because I really do believe they're the answer to the world and what we need to do. And we are the light. Let's be the light. God bless.